So today we're chatting with James Yuri on the sales team here at Close, and we're going to be getting some thoughts about how to sell with confidence. We're going to be busting some sales myths about cold calling. So thank you for joining us, James. Yeah, absolutely. So first off, this idea of selling with confidence. I know this was something that we had chatted about. I would love to hear more about your thoughts on this idea of selling with confidence and how to do that. So when people think about confidence, I think that some people think it you're born with it or you're not. Hmm. And for some people, that's true. Some people are just naturally confident and that's great. But I was talking with a friend of mine, Matt Hines, and I'll, I'll link him in the comments. So if you want to have this conversation with him, he was creating a sales playbook around selling with confidence. And he got word of this recipe for selling with confidence. And what he told me, and I loved this, was he said, repetition equals experience, experience equals knowledge, knowledge equals confidence, and confidence equals success. And he was building his entire sales playbook around this thought and idea. And I completely agree with it because if you're confident about anything, it's just easier to communicate with people, regardless if it's in a social situation or in a professional setting, being confident about something makes everything easier, especially mm -hmm. in selling. And so I loved the idea of this because I think confidence can be learned, especially in this context, especially with this recipe. So as a sales leader, when you're hiring folks, maybe you hire someone who's junior, but they have a lot of potential, they have a good energy, they have a really good disposition, they're well articulated, but maybe they don't have that confidence factor yet. So how do you build that up in them? And this recipe, I think, is perfect. It's a guideline that can get them to that point. And so as a sales leader, you can ask yourself the questions. Are your reps getting enough repetition in your sales process and training to gain the experience they need? So we want that repetition to translate into experience, right? Is there enough repetition for it to equal true experience in the sales process and in the sales training? And then is that repetition translating into that experience that you're looking for? They're getting experience, but there's going to be these knowledge gaps. So do they have enough experience where they're asking questions to their other team members, to asking questions to you as a sales leader? Are they asking around the company to try and figure these things out? That's naturally going to happen when you start having repetition, more experience. You start asking these questions that start to fill these knowledge gaps. And so enough experience is going to translate into that knowledge, that expert knowledge that you need as a salesperson. You need to be an industry expert, you need to be an expert in what you're selling. And that's going to come from that experience. So are you starting to see them communicate as an expert as a result of that repetition and experience, so that they are a knowledgeable expert in what you are selling and in the industry. Once they get to that point where they are communicating as an expert, they have that knowledge, you're going to see that confidence just naturally come out. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see, let's go back to the junior sales rep, who has all this potential and you put him through this recipe, him or her through this recipe, that confidence is going to come with this recipe. I, I truly believe it. And my buddy, Matt, and perhaps maybe ask him about this, how it's going with his team. He says that this works. It's effective. I've talked to some of his sales reps on a call to chat through what they think about this. And it, it does, it works. And it's something definitely to think about. And once they are knowledgeable experts, they're going to be selling with confidence, which is going to equal success. Those conversion rates are going to go up. The numbers are going to go up because people buy from people that they trust. And typically you trust someone who is an expert and extremely confident in what they're selling. That's awesome. That makes so much sense. So confidence can be trained, basically. You don't I have to be so. born with it. <laughs> I think so. And it's from being knowledgeable in some sort of field or topic, really. <laughs> I love that. So I think that's our first sales myth that we've busted. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We were, supposed to, we were supposed to wait till later, but I think that counts as a sales myth that we've busted. Confidence is not something you are born with. You can be trained to be confident. <laughs> Agreed. Absolutely. Cool. So let's move on to our next sales cool. myths that we're going to bust today. Cool. So this idea has come up many times in many different studies if you search for the best time to cold call or the best time to cold email, 
you'll find studies from different places that said, here, we've emailed all of these people. We called all these people. These are our results. And every single one is different, <laughs> which I find hilarious. So you're talking about this idea, this sales myth. Is there a perfect time for cold calling or cold emailing? And I love some of your thoughts in general on cold calling and cold emailing as well. So I'm going to speak to this from my personal perspective, my personal opinion. I haven't run all of these reports, right? Some people love data where they're like, we've done this test, we've done this test and here are results. And if you're watching this video and you've done these and you found a perfect recipe and time of day, like comment, let us know. Like we want to know what you found. Uh, was it effective? Was it not? Are you still unsure? Tell us. Now, my thought on this is it's tough because behavior is so different based on the persona that you're selling to. So it's going to be different based on the behavior of that persona, but there are common behaviors between all human beings, regardless of persona. So I think that's the baseline that you start from. And my, my thoughts around that, and I'll start with cold calling, is unless someone, <laughs> this is just a general statement about people and habits and common behavior with phones, if someone is in the habit of answering their phone because that's how their business works, and from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., maybe even later, they're constantly keeping an eye on their phone because if they answer it and it's a number that they don't know, it might drive new business for them. Those people are going to be a lot easier to get a hold of, right, on a cold call. Mm. Uh, think of a realtor, right? They get a call from a random number because their buddy said, hey, call my realtor so-and-so. And they call him and they see a random number. They think opportunity. Yeah. And so there are different personas like this in the business world where their habit is I answer the phone every time, period, or I'm going to call you back. If I have a missed call, I'm going to call you back. And so in, in that context, that works. If there is like a human being where their habit and their business is to answer the phone, they're going to answer your cold call. So you better nail that call. If you can add value to their life, make sure that that cold call is awesome and is on point. Now, for other folks, for a general baseline of how people function in their day to day as a professional, I think a lot of folks, including myself, from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., you're kind of in grind mode, right? I think 10 a.m. hits and you get to this point where your mind is still fresh, but you'd slow down a little bit from like 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Mm. Maybe you get a snack, you take a break for a couple minutes. And so perhaps your phone rings and it's a number you don't know. And I'm making assumptions. This is my opinion. I think that people would be more inclined between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. their time to answer the phone because they're in this moment. They have this momentum of being productive. They're still drinking their coffee a little bit. Why not? I'll take the call. And again, if they do answer, nail that call. And I'll get into that in a minute. Now, the other time of day is I think less ideal, but I still think that there is a good opportunity for folks to answer a call between this time. And I think it's after lunch, hmm. uh, between the hours of 1 and 3 p.m., now, a lot of our productivity happens in the morning. We take a lunch, we eat, we slow down a little bit. The food slows us down sometimes. If you're eating a bigger lunch, I don't yep. know. You know, there's this <laughs> that afternoon lull that every human being talks about. Sometimes that could be you're doing stuff that is not as heavy lifting at work. Some people might zone out on Instagram or LinkedIn for 30 minutes. I don't know. And so you catch them in the zone where they might not be feeling all that productive. So a call might make them feel like they're being productive. They're like, well, yeah, I probably shouldn't be on LinkedIn right now. I'm just going to take this call and maybe it's a work call and something I need to do. So it like makes them feel productive. So they answer the phone. And again, nail that call. If they answer the phone, don't make it feel like a sales call. You're never going to catch anybody at the right time where they're pumped about taking a sales call. But if you nail that call, they're more likely to talk to you. And that comes down to being just a human being on that call, not just a salesperson. And I recently saw a post with Jason Bay, and he was talking to a couple of fellows who they do cold calling on a regular basis. And Nick, who was on in that post, he talked about his strategy for cold calling, and it made so much sense. It was very human. It was very real. 
And it was just acknowledging the fact that, yes, I am making a cold call. I am a salesperson, but I do think that I can add value to your life. I was very much in alignment on how they do it. It was very human. So those are my, my thoughts on time of day for cold calling. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's basically, it depends on the person. It depends on who you're talking to, but no matter what time of day you call, it's not going to be the perfect time for them to receive a sales call and be ready for it. Nobody's waiting at at their office for a sales call. (laughs) Correct. And the the other element of that, which I mentioned at the beginning was persona. I sell to salespeople. Some people sell to engineers. Some people sell to marketing directors. Some people sell to HR directors. These personas are so much different in how they behave. And I don't think that there's a perfect recipe. So like functioning from that baseline of just typical human behavior. But if you want to get more surgical, you break it down to the persona and learn the behavior of that persona. How do you do that? Uh, Well, think about it internally at your own company. You probably have a director of engineering, a director of marketing, a director of HR. If you're a salesperson, you're coming up with a sales strategy to sell to that persona, talk to the people that are in your back pocket and ask them how they behave and why they would uh, accept a cold call or when they would accept a cold call or why they would read your cold email and get their inside information about that. They probably know other people in the industry that have friends that do the same exact thing. Be like, hey, as a favor, can I connect with your friend who also does the same thing and ask them the same questions? Get in their head and understand who that person is and how that persona functions. There's going to be patterns and trends that you can identify so that you can be more strategic about that call or that email. And on the email side, that's timing. And that's also content. Like, what are you going to read? Why will you open this email and reply to me? And once you do have a successful interaction with somebody, right, you're cold calling them or you email them and you get on a scheduled call with them, ask them, why did you take my call? Like, why did you schedule this? Why did you read my email? Why did you respond? Why did you click this link? Like, why? I'm just curious. One, that just pulls down the guard, right? From the salesperson, right? You're just acknowledging like, this is my job. This is what I'm doing. It requires a lot of creativity. It's very difficult. And getting on this call is extremely valuable and it's very hard. Why are you here? Tell me about that. And they're going to tell you, regardless of the persona, they're probably going to appreciate the fact that you're acknowledging that. And it's going to lead to a warmer conversation into what you're selling in the first place. So get into their head, understand the persona that you're selling to. That's going to make it easier, both on the email front and the cold calling front. Yeah, that makes so much sense. So it's finding the right time of day, right time of the week for the persona, for the person that you're actually talking to and getting into that. And I think that's so true with so many different aspects of sales, no, is getting into the head of the people that you are talking to, (laughs) as far as you said, like either timing or content, like both aspects of that, when you're coming up in a cold interaction with a prospect, like you need to know who you're talking to before you can even formulate what you're going to say. Yep, absolutely. And just a rebuttal question to you, Amy, and then we'll talk about what the structure of a cold email could look like and how you should think about writing a cold email. If you can acknowledge your title, what you do at close, do you get sales emails? And when would you ever respond or reply or schedule a time? Ooh, that's a good question. So yeah, so I work on the marketing team at close. I'm a content specialist and I do get actually a lot of cold emails, especially from um, people who are looking to do guest posts on the blog and basically things related to marketing partnerships and things like that. So I guess I would read it if it looks like it actually came from a person. I get a lot that I notice that don't look like they came from an actual person. Just from the first few words, you can kind of tell whether somebody actually wrote this or if it's just something that is just being regurgitated. I've actually received the exact same email from like several different people at a company before. That's happened to me multiple times. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and those I don't open and I don't reply to because it's like, ah, it's another one of these. It's, I just got the same one yesterday from someone else. <laughs> so do you just directly archive it? You don't even read it. Mark it as read. You just yeah. archive it. No, okay. I would just delete it. Yeah. So the okay. ones that I reply to definitely are the ones that I can see someone has taken the time to actually do the research. Most of the cold emails that I'm getting are offering to write a post on the closed blog. The moment that I would reply is when I look into an email and I see that they've actually taken a look at the closed blog and they've seen what's there and they've referenced maybe a certain post or a certain topic that we're interested in. Cause I'll get a lot of these emails that are very general. 
And they'll say, I want to do a post on the closed blog about how to cold email. And it's like, well, we already have like, yeah, I don't even know how much content we have already about cold emailing. Like what exactly are you, what exactly do you want to write about? It doesn't, that's not, it's very general. Or even I've seen emails that are like, these are examples of the posts that I've written before and they have absolutely nothing to do with sales. And it's like, well, that's great. I'm happy that you've written these posts, but I don't know why that's valuable to me. Right. So if they can prove why they're contacting me at this company, then I will take the time to reply. Have you ever had any cold emails where you thought, wow, this person nailed it. And I do want to collaborate with this person. I have, I definitely have. This one was a very interesting message that I got on LinkedIn and it wasn't so much a cold email as in sales. It was actually just something that really provided mutual value to both of us. So this one was, she says, hi, Amy, happy Friday. I saw you referenced our research in a sales engagement blog. Thanks so much. If you're ever looking for more stats to support your points, feel free to reach out and I'll share anything relevant. So that's mutually beneficial because I would love research to support my points on the blog. Yeah. And they want backlinks to their website. Sure. So it was actually super valuable to me. And we have a conversation and now I, I regularly go back and forth with her when I'm looking for specific research on certain topics. So that was definitely one that stood out to me like, wow, that's really good. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. That's a really interesting perspective. I completely agree with you. I get a lot of sales emails too. I mean, salesperson and I get a lot of sales emails and hmm. I'm the persona who should be looking at it and acknowledging them because it's like your fellow folks out there in the world hustling and grinding. And what it comes down to is simply, I don't have the time. And a lot of what people mm. are selling, like, I don't need. And these emails that I get are typically long. They are templated. They are not personalized. 95% of the time, they're not personalized. And so just like you, I'll still open it. I will skim through it quickly just to ensure that it's not a prospect making sure that my assumptions are not incorrect, skim through it, make sure there's no call to action for me, archive. That's one last thing I have to deal with in my inbox, right? Mm. That is 95% of the sales emails that I get. Now, for those 5% where they nail it, there's a couple of things that they do really well. And this is how I think a cold email should be structured, is it's brief, it's not long at all. No one likes long emails. Make it brief, but make it valuable. What value are you offering me? What are you selling me? And don't make it just sound like you're just trying to sell me something. Like make it valuable. That person that chatted with you, you had a reaction to it. Like, oh, this is actually does add value to my life. People should have that reaction to your email. That's how they will respond and schedule time with you. So make it brief, make it valuable, make it human. Introduce your own voice. Make it sound like you sat down and wrote it. I introduced some of my slang and how I would talk to people on a call or friends into my emails when I'm trying to engage somebody because it sounds real. It sounds human. It sounds like I took the time and I did. And that's where you're going to get a much better response. My personal philosophy in cold emailing is quality versus quantity. You can play both games and you can test both and maybe the industry that you're in quantity does work better. But... For the most part, when you are selling to a market that is diluted and there's a million other people selling, quality is going to be your best friend. So I, when I'm talking to a lot of folks at close and they have an outbound sales process, I walk them through a workflow that I think is effective for outbound sales. And in close, you can compose an email. You can either grab a template or write a personalized email or grab a template and then personalize the template. Mm -hmm. Then you can say, if they don't respond, let's say by Friday or in a week or two weeks, then enroll them into an email sequence. That first email should be highly personalized and get their attention. Now at scale, if you just want to, you know, personalize that first one, if they don't reply, then enroll them into an email sequence. Those additional follow-up emails should be really brief. Just tapping them on the shoulder, not in an annoying way, asking them really brief questions and make it feel human as well. Maybe start even the first word in that follow-up email with no capital, right? Like a lower case, making it feel really human. It's these really, really small things and small touches, but mm -hmm. quality versus quantity and cold emailing is going to be more productive for you. That makes sense. And I like what you said that 
it with your cold emails, it sounds like you took the time because you did. Because I did that kind of personalization and that kind of those little details, it does take some time. It takes a little yeah. bit more time than a templated generic cold email would, but it's yeah. worth it in the end. The results are absolutely worth it. Absolutely.